audiobook narrator Mike Scott. When selecting your next audiobook, choose from some of the great titles narrated by audiobook narrator Mike Scott, like Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864. And if you're an author or publisher interested in having your written works produced as audiobooks, give Mike a shout at MikeScottVoice.com. Mike Scott, the voice of history. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, Ask a Gettysburg Guide. Uh, I'm your host, Matt. Uh, for those of you watching us on uh, Facebook, um, the, here's the deal. And, and this also goes to our patrons on the uh, first lieutenant level. There will be no video. Well, maybe if we can somehow get this, but it's not the normal video. Our software has crashed. It's a compatibility issue with uh, the the RAM sticks, and I don't know what this stuff means, but we've been having a little bit of trouble with uh, the computer, and so uh, we're just doing this as an audio version and then a live uh, Facebook uh, video. So it's not going to have all the fancy schmancy, you know, visuals and the changing of cameras. Um, I think, what is it? Just uh, Yeah, it's just the overhead camera, which is, uh, you know, terrible angle for uh, for people who are as vain as I am. Um, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about John Burns. And who better to have with us to talk about John Burns than uh, Tim Smith? Hello, Tim. Hello. You wrote a book about John Burns. I did. What's it called? It's called John Burns, The Hero of Gettysburg. Oh, and is that in quotes, The Hero of Gettysburg? I put The Hero of Gettysburg's in in quotes, The Hero of Gettysburg, because that's the name he called himself. (laughs) And so I wanted to make sure that people, you know, understood that, you know. He's a humble guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So before we get into uh, anything, everybody, I just want to remind you to like, share, and subscribe. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all that stuff. And uh, if you use the Apple Podcast app, please leave a five-star review. Uh, Okay. Now, let's get into John Burns. Give us a little background on the man. Why do we know his name? Uh, what was what did he do before he fought and 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 defeated single-handedly the Confederate Army here at Gettysburg? Well, you know, um, one thing I should mention from my um, own point of view, I, I, I don't I don't think I, you know, usually I remember the first time that I was aware of something or someone or the first time I understood a certain story. And I couldn't tell you when the first time I became interested in John Burns was. Hmm. I would guess it was on one of my first trips to Gettysburg when I bought that uh, little comic book about the Battle of Gettysburg, um, the one that, uh, you know, they've reprinted over the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, By uh, Frederick Ray. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Burns is one of the people featured in that. But I I wanted to say that, um, uh, you know, I became interested in his story, and I looked around and realized that no one had ever written anything on him. Uh, There were two people that told me that they were writing book on John Burns, and um, I had decided that, well, they're going to write a book about him, so uh, I won't write a book about him. And one of those was Greg Coco. Now, Greg Coco and I had several discussions on the John Burns book. <clears throat> and he, Coco had written a number of books. Coco was insistent that a John Burns book should only be like 50 pages, that she should tell the media the story, get the story over with, and she sell for like three or four dollars around town. Right. A and you know, he's probably right. You know, it's not like my. But how many pages is your book? Uh, it's not like the John Burns books that has sold a lot. And I remember when it came out, he told me it was way too long. But uh, 200, 204 pages. Oh, wow. If you count my bi- author biography and photograph. Okay, so 203. And then, and then uh, Richard Sowers. I had a long discussion with him about, um, he was writing a John Burns book. But something happened as time went by, and I talked to, you know, both of them a couple times and said, well, how's your John Burns project coming? And both of them kind of dropped the project. And I thought, you know, I'm going to write a book that. Okay. There was no one else working on it. It seemed clear. What had happened for me that in, the most interesting thing about it was that I came up with all these other people that had collected John Burns' research. I remember hmm. I was at Gettysburg College and I was looking in uh, the, the 
National Catalog of Union Manuscripts, which is a, a series of published volumes they have in colleges of research that's in various uh, college libraries and repositories around the country. And, of course, I was interested in Jenny Wade. And, you know, of course, I had been working on the Jenny Wade book mm-hmm. for, for some time. And uh, uh, I realized that there's a guy named John Way Johnston in Rochester, New York. And John Way Johnston was going to write a book on John Burns. He wrote a book on Jenny Wade in 1917, The True right. Story of Jenny Wade. So he's going to write a book on uh, John Burns. And he never did. But he collected all this research. He purchased things that Burns owned. He was going to have a museum in Gettysburg and put some stuff on display from John Burns and Jenny Wade. Interesting. It's kind of like bookends, you know, John Burns and Jenny Wade, famous Gettysburg civilians. Sure. So he collected all this research. No one had ever looked at it. It was just sitting in a Rochester Museum and Science Center archives. And I read a little bit about what was contained in that collection. And then there was a guy at the Adams County Historical Society, of course, where I have worked for many years. I never met the guy. The guy worked there as a volunteer from 1980 until I think 1984. His name was Douglas Harder. He was from near Harrisburg. He was retired. And he, for four years as a volunteer, came to the Historical Society and collected stuff on John Burns. He wrote to Scotland to try to find out about his lineage. He uh, he had uh, corresponded with uh, uh, John Burns's uh, um, or John White Johnson's son. Uh, he got some donations for the Historical Society from Johnston uh, Burns stuff. Um, he went through the local records, the tax records, and he did some research on some properties. And he was going to write a book on John Burns. But he um, uh, came down with cancer. Mm. Um, uh, He got sick. He died. His book was never published. Then there was a third guy named John, um, um, who am I thinking of? John Lewis Sowers. J. Lewis Sowers was a local school teacher here in Gettysburg. And John White Johnston of Rochester had hired him as a local researcher. And he interviewed people. And pulled together a whole bunch of research on John Burns. And I, years ago, purchased at uh, one of the relic shows a binder of his that was filled with his research on Jenny Wade and John Burns for John White Johnston. So I had three other people who had collected material to write a book on John Mm. Burns and did not. Mm. And then, of course, I had my own research, which I think is pretty good. Yeah. So... I pulled together a lot of the interviews with different people and newspaper articles and stuff. And then I had these three other people's research. And if you do notice in the introduction of my book, I say this book is dedicated to the memory of John White Johnston, Douglas J. Harder, and J. Lewis Sowers. Okay, so you acknowledge that. So these uh, are the researchers who helped me obtain the massive amount of material that I have for this book. Okay. Now, the other thing was about writing a biography, and I've seen, I've seen a lot of biographies, and I've come to the conclusion that you write a biography about somebody if you like them. Right. Or if you hate them. Oh. That there's not too many biographies that are written. In the middle. Yeah, to yeah. analyze, you know, someone. John Burns is such an interesting person. If I was a big John Burns you know, worshiper, or I liked him a lot. You could, you know, use the stuff he said, and you could you could over glorify his um, role mm-hmm. in in the battle. And of course, um, there are people that didn't like John Burns in our local community, and you can find things that you know people said about him that aren't as complimentary. But what I thought I would do. Uh, is put everything together, and there's a there's another thing about the story, and um, you were uh, mentioning to me that uh, David Martin was talking about this um, when he was on, mm-hmm. and that's the fact that we have interviews with John Burns himself. Right, he survived, and people asked him questions, and I would say that even after the book, I found a few that I might have nine interviews where John Burns is telling his own story to someone. And in all those different accounts, 
the story's different every time. <laughs> Uh, okay it's not it's not that he tells a story and over time it gets better it's just different just different is it not always better no it's just it's just he tells it different every time okay and um so what i thought i would do and i don't know if someone else would have done it the same i'm sure they wouldn't have done it the same way i did it is i lay out the basic story of john burns in the book in the battle, and I analyze the different things that he says and point out, point, I like to point out the different things that he says and how they can conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. And then I use all the other known accounts of the fighting around him mm -hmm. and try to sort out what, you know, happened and what didn't happen. And okay. you know, some things will never sort out. Of course. But um, that, that's kind of the, uh, way I went about it. And I think a lot of people like the book because, um, because uh, of the, uh, the way I like to analyze stuff in the book. And, you know, in the acknowledgments, I have this quote at the beginning in acknowledgments, one of my favorite, favorite quotes. Stealing from one is plagiarism. Stealing from many is research. <laughs> That is a good one. And um, there's certainly a lot of research in my book. Yeah. So what what is it, though, that is so interesting about John Burns? Well, I think, here's here, from my perspective, yeah. this is what I like about John Burns. I don't have to have a perfect hero. I think we talked about this one on, on another show, probably mm. in another uh, segment for a different reason. My heroes are scarred. Flawed. My, they're flawed. Yeah. They're flawed. Yeah. yeah they, they, they have issues and problems. So John Burns is a braggart. Mm -hmm. He's um, not very humble. No. He is uh, obviously uh, not popular. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, likes to argue with people. He is a person that believes in black and white. Uh, there is no middle There's ground. There's no middle ground, no gray. And um, the, in, the, in the introduction, I tried to give some sense of, you know, what kind of person he was. And the one thing that people keep mentioning about him is he doesn't have a sense of humor. He Humorless. Doesn't, he doesn't know when you're joking. Oh, okay. And he doesn't know how to take a joke. And because of that... <sighs> He's the butt of many jokes oh. in the town in the, uh, prior to the really? war. Really? Okay. He's a little short guy. He's, got a, he's from a Scotch-Irish background. He's very fiery, mm. and he gets upset a lot. Cantankerous. Cantankerous. And here's a guy that doesn't seem to be very popular. Um, nobody takes him seriously. And yet, on the first day of the battle, he... Obtains a musket, goes out on the battlefield, joins in the firing line. Right. And a time, a account after account after account of the soldiers who see him, they make fun of him. And they're laughing at him. Maybe he doesn't know it. And it provides a, a little bit of um, uh, levity yeah. in a very serious situation on the afternoon of July 1st. Right. And every single person thinks when that battle starts, he's going to run. And they're going to all laugh when they see him running away. And the fighting starts, and he doesn't run. And he gets wounded, and he stays on the firing line. And he does the unexpected. He actually fights in the battle as a participant and gains the respect of everyone who saw him and was around him. Okay. And reading everything that I read about him up until that point, you know, I still expect him to run, you know, uh -huh. okay. and he doesn't. And that that being able to overcome all your issues and problems, and you know, um, rise uh, to the occasion, rise to the occasion yeah. is what you know. I think I like about him the most. I I agree with you. Like uh, I like the guys who just keep losing, keep losing, and then they get one win, but it's a big win. Like that's why I like Grant. You know, he's kind of a loser, and then the war happens, and he's yeah. like, hey, I finally found my footing, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> um, but so 
what, so, did, what is let John? Answer, let me ask you a question because you did yeah. ask a question at the beginning. What was it? What what what, what is he like or what oh, he's yeah. doing? Yeah, why is he why do you, why is he so interesting? But um um, you know his background. Uh, he is born in Burlington County, New Jersey. Oh, uh, during the War of eighteen twelve, he um, and this is an interesting thing. You know when you read. Uh, the various accounts by Burns himself uh -huh. and by people who interviewed Burns. <clears throat> he talks about his uh, military action. And a lot of the authors believe that uh, uh, his previous military action is what led him to join in the fighting line at Gettysburg because he was a battle-hardened veteran. Right. And in, in an interview with Samuel Bates, uh, who wrote a little biography of him, um, uh, the Pennsylvania historian, um, he even talks about the Battle of Lundy's Lane and his role in the battle. He gives the name of his regiment. He gives the name of his captain. He gives details of the battle, mm. details that, you know, are somewhat accurate that, of his regiment attacking a British artillery position. Um, the problem is when previous researchers have tried to figure out where he was, they've run into problems. His name does not appear on the roll of the unit he says he's in. The name of the captain is not a captain in that unit. Um, uh, John White Johnson thought that maybe he was at the Battle of Fort McHenry in 1814 in Baltimore. And um, the promise name doesn't appear on any of those units. Um, I think it was Douglas Harder was able to track him down as being in a Pennsylvania unit near Philadelphia in the War of 1812 in a unit that saw no action. Uh -huh. And what's really interesting is in 1820, um, Burns moves to Adams County and he lives in various places around the county. And there is a company from Adams County that was at the Battle of Lundy's Lane. So I think that some of the stories he told he got from, from other, other veterans people. of the War of 1812 yeah. who lived here. Now, he did get some bounty land for his War of 1812 service. Okay. But again, he's in a unit in Philadelphia that saw no action. Some accounts suggest that he was a veteran of the Mexican War. But one might suspect to be a veteran of the Mexican War, you might have to have traveled to Mexico at some point. <laughs> and clearly... He was not he, in a unit that traveled to Mexico. So what brought him to Gettysburg from uh, New Jersey? Not, not quite sure. Uh, we have, you know, I, can, I know who his father was. Um, I, uh, I haven't uh, found a lot of information about his father in the records of Burlington County, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't, granted, I hadn't, haven't spent a lot of time there scouring for his father. John Burns himself said that his father was from uh, Scotland and that they were ancestors of the famous poet or relatives of the famous poet Robert Burns. And people have tried to figure that out and haven't been able to. Burns is kind of a common name. Yeah, I would say it's kind of a yeah. common name. So, um, <clears throat> but, um, but so, so the... You, you said you haven't really looked too hard, but uh, you couldn't find anything no, back in Burlington. I do know he's in Newtown in Bucks County during the War of 1812. So he and, hopped and over the river. at some point, by 1820, he makes his appearance here in the tax records. We're very fortunate that in Adams County, there was another guy named John Burns. And it was a John Burns that lived in Franklin County also. So for whatever reason, early on, he started using his middle initial. John L. Burns. Okay. John Lawrence Burns, it turns out. All right. Um, John White Johnson was able to purchase his family's Bible with his date of birth in it. So we had a good idea of his date of birth. Okay. And um, uh, John Lawrence Burns it appears in the records, John L. Burns. Now, he, he doesn't seem to live in one place in Adams County for very long. He kind of moves around. Like, he lives in Bennersville for a time. In the 1860 census, he's in Bonneville. Huh. Um, he lives in Gettysburg on and off, but he lives in Cumberland Township. He lives in Strabane Township. Is he um, kind of like, uh, like, is he not holding down any jobs? Like, what's his profession all um, this time? He has a bunch of different odd jobs. Okay. And um, 
uh, at the Adams County Historical Society, uh, we have some receipts and some business ledgers, ledgers that give an idea of the kinds of work that he did. But he was basically a day laborer. Okay. Uh, we have him. The town had uh, a position called Wood Quarter. And I'd imagine it was a person that went out and cut wood, wood yeah. for the borough, whether it be the county courthouse or the county jail or the schools. So we have him uh, as a wood quarter. Uh, for a time, we know he does work with uh, David McConaughey, I'm sorry, um, David Kendallhart, as a shoemaker, a cobbler. Kendallhart's the borough council president? Yeah. Okay. And so we know he was a cobbler there for a time. Um, we also know that he worked for the Gettysburg Water Company. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, there was a retaining pond up on High Street, not far I, <clears throat> excuse me, near um, High and uh, Stratton Street. And um, okay, there were springs down near, uh, you know, the Sweeney House or the Dobbin House on South Baltimore Street. And it was some kind of pumping system. And I, I'd imagine his day-to-day -day job was to go over there and for a few hours a day pump, pump. water into the pond. The so they would pump it from, the, there's the that pump down by the Rupp House is what you're talking yeah. about, right? Is it the Rupp? No, it's not by yeah, the Rupp. Yeah, it is the Rupp House, yeah. Um, so there's that pump there, and then they would pump it from there up the hill yeah. to a retaining to pond? retaining pond, and then from the hill, gravity would force the water through pipes into the center of the town where there were pumps at different locations. Amazing. And he worked for the Gettysburg Water Company, and I don't know how many employees they had. So, um, and then also, of course... Uh, at different points in his life, he is um, a constable. A constable is an elected position in the town for two years. Hmm. And um, every uh, time they have the borough election, <clears throat> to every two years for the constable, he would um, uh, run. And he wasn't co uh, the constable all the time. Uh, different parties would get that there were two constables at any one time but we have him as a constable for various years from the 1850s into the early 1860s he's constable in 1862 but he is not constable at the time of the battle as is in many books but if he so if it's an elected position people must have liked him a little bit at least mm -hmm. But, you know, looking over all the people that were constables uh -huh. through the time period there, yeah. the constable seems to be a job that is given to someone who needs money and doesn't uh. have another job. I mean, I don't want to demean the constables, but when you look at all, all the people that serve as constables. Um, they were having a hard lot before. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're all older that uh, don't have other means of income. Now, okay. the constable's not the sheriff. We have a sheriff. Right. right. The constable doesn't really, like, enforce the laws. The no. constable keeps track of things, and he's more of a, um, a court-appointed official that would serve warrants for right. people and stuff like that. Subpoenas and warrants so, yeah, and all that yeah. stuff. And keep track on people. And his hobby seemed to be, like, tattletaling. That was one thing he was really good at. <laughs> So he sounds like a wonderful guy. Yeah. Um, uh, so and, oh, I, I was going to mention oh, yeah. in the Adams County Historical Society, we have the returns of the constable for the various years. And up here on my screen, I have John Burns constable return um, uh, uh, for uh, 1862. And what's really interesting about it, uh, they, they it tell you their duties. They have to uh, make sure all the fingerboards are in good repair, meaning the, <laughs> The fingerboards that tell you Baltimore, 52 miles. Oh, or, oh, okay. Or, you know, Breckenridge yeah. Street. They have to make sure that no deer were killed out of season. Um, they have to make sure that no one is selling over a certain amount of liquor without a license, that there's no gambling being done wow. at the various places in town. Um, they have to make sure there's no disturbances during the elections, and all the tavern keepers have their proper licenses. And um, they make have to make sure there were no one of the um, – it doesn't say on this particular one I'm looking at, but – also, before the war, they had to make sure that um, slaves were not brought through the town um, 
and I, I, I don't exactly know why that was in here, but, you know, prior to the war, that makes sense. And also to have to keep track of all the bastard children that are born in the town. <laughs> wow. And in 1862, John Burns records that there was one bastard child born in his bailiwick. <laughs> and the, master, the child was born, a female child, to a girl named Martha Gilbert. Okay. He reported his adopted daughter's illegitimate child. Oh. Burns and his wife, and his wife, I should say, is a Hagerman, and she's from Bonnieville. Okay. They didn't have any children, but they adopted a child from the almshouse. Um, I think they adopted her about 1840. Maybe a little, maybe I forget her age. It's in my, if you really want to know facts, you have to read, read the, the book. book. Of course. But um, Martha Gilbert had a hard life. Um, she gave birth to this child. John and his wife took care of her. Martha disappears about 1868. We don't know what happened. Martha, to the wife disappeared. The, the stepdaughter. The stepdaughter. Yeah. What's the wife's name again? Barbara. Barbara. Barbara okay. Hagerman. And, um, uh, I found a few letters about this by people who remember the granddaughter yeah. and remembered Mar Martha. And they said that um, she ran away because of John Burns. As a matter of fact, I have two sources that suggest that John Burns may be the father of his adopted daughter's oh, illegitimate child. He's the Woody Allen of Gettysburg. So what is, uh, wh who are these sources? Are they? Um, I, again, you would have to read the book. Of course. Yes. They're not good sources. <laughs> okay. And maybe I shouldn't be telling this story because it's a rumor passed down. Okay. But since he chose to badmouth Jenny, Jenny Wade, Wade, I knew it. Then he gets I his. knew it. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to badmouth Jenny Wade like he does. Hey, listen, presence. what's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? right? If That's he could right. do it, you can do That's it. That's right. No, but so you say they're not good sources, but are they contemporary at least? Or? Yeah, well, there are people remembering back saying, hey, I heard that. And he's long gone by the time yeah, they're saying he's this? he's long gone by uh, the time okay. they're saying it. But for whatever reason, his stepdaughter disappears. The only other thing I should tell you about him is clearly John Burns is a serious drinker in his early days. He looks it. But by the 1840s, he was one of the members of the Gettysburg Temperance Society. Oh. And his name appears on various, uh, as an officer sometimes, in the temperance conventions hmm. that they had that were held. Okay. And um, there's a time when I believe he and Jenny Wade's dad are part of the same temperance society. It wasn't until more recently I figured this out. Wait, so Jenny Wade's dad was part of the temperance society, but didn't he have his well, own Well, you know, he, he, I think that was a temporary thing that he was part of the uh, temperance society. Like when someone is court ordered to go to AA, <laughs> like that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, it didn't stick. It yeah, didn't stick with yeah. him. But, you know, I should mention that uh, James Wade, Jenny's father, is in and out of jail at the time when John Burns is part of the law enforcement community of the town. Right, okay. So he would have known him quite well and his activities quite well. Okay. So that might account for some of the nastiness that John Burns, you know, has towards Jenny and her family after Jenny. I dad. see, okay. That makes so, some sense. But, you know, there's this is very interesting stuff. Um, also, I, I should mention it, we know that John Burns lives in a house at the end of Chambersburg Street on the west end of town at the time of the Civil War. Right. But again, he just moved into that house and he rents that house. Okay. Uh, he did purchase the house and own it for a time. I think he may have purchased it, um, uh, I don't remember the date off the time I had, 1862, uh, and he owns it until 1868. So he owns it for a short time. But he owns it during the battle. He owns it during the battle. Okay. And he has his photograph taken in front of that house. Right. And of course, that house is associated with him. It's no longer there though, right? Uh, no. It it's no longer a different stands. house. It was torn down in the 1890s. And there are two houses that set where that house would have set today. Um, so, you know, um, there's a bunch of... We can find... Uh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Who were, uh, who were some of his neighbors that also... Uh, um, well, you know, in the book, I put a little map to uh, 
show the neighborhood they lived in. There weren't as many buildings at the edge of the t- the western edge of town at the time that there are now. Mm. But uh, John Burns lives in the house, uh, the last house, I, I guess at the intersection of uh, West Street, Chambersburg Street, Springs Avenue, and Buford Avenue today. Um, but his closest neighbor to the east was John Slentz, and he's the father of John Slentz that lives at the um, uh, McPherson Farm. Right, okay. And um, across the street, we have a lady, uh, Jerome Walters and his wife live, and we have a, uh, I don't have all the owners on my map here, but William Ashball lives directly across the street, and I have, um, I think, uh, Delilah Tate. I ha- Aren't I, the Broadheads nearby? The Broadheads do live nearby. Yeah. They're all in the same block, just a little bit farther up the street. Okay, so uh, you were going to go into something when I interrupted you. Well, John Burns is interesting person. Remember before I mentioned that he takes the, everything very seriously, right? And he is um, uh, what we might uh, c- compare today to a over the top Trumpster. <laughs> okay, he is a and. When I say that, I'm just drawing a illusion, and you know he's he's very patriotic. Okay. But I would remind everyone that the most patriotic people in the world are were called Nazis. <laughs> that there's, so he, there's John a Burns was a Nazi. Patriotic. Right, right, right. So, he, and I and I say this, he was part in the 1850s of a thing called the American Party. They were the know nothings. Mm. And he actually, I found an account where he's giving a lecture to a group of young people, uh, uh, the Sons of Temperance, a young man's group of t- beloved, you know, temperance. Uh, uh, got, uh, I guess they're going to join the temperance party when they get older. But uh, Burns um, lectures them on Americanism and what it's what it is to be an American. And of course, their definition of an American and know nothings are that. No one who wasn't born in this country should be voting. As a matter of fact, wow. we should have really strict laws against immigrants. Uh oh. Keeping in mind that most of the people in this group are right. parents were German or right. their parents were Irish. Right. Now that we're here. Also, Catholics are a serious issue. Well, I agree with that. We, we, because we... they believe in the Pope, and yes. they will do what the Pope says over what the president says. Yes, and yes. So, so you get these, it, they're extreme in their beliefs, is mm-hmm. my point, uh-huh. I guess. Gotcha. And um, Burns is part of that. And the outbreak of the war suits him just fine. And... Um, one, of, one of the persons, uh, one of the townspeople that went to church with Burns, Burns really didn't go to church. His wife went to the Methodist church, but every once in a while he would show up. But this person made the observation that Burns would never say anything and wouldn't come to any meetings unless there was a problem. And then he would come, and this guy said, this is the important part, he always took sides. <laughs> so... He, and I think I think it's kind of interesting that he, when uh, at the outbreak of the war, when Gettysburg is forming units to, uh, you know, join the rebellion and fight right. the rebels, he is like, you know, um, at the head of the the crowd, chanting the boys on, and 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 you know, he's really good for that, for drumming up the uh, patriotism in the crowd, and he tried to join. Company K, 1st Pennsylvania Reserves. Mm-hmm. But he was too old, and uh, they actually had more people that tried to join that unit than were able to join it. So hmm. he didn't end up um, being part of that uh, unit. But he did then follow, um, at the beginning of the war, Company E of the 2nd Pennsylvania. He actually followed that unit down uh, into Hagerstown, and he ended up getting a job as a teamster at Frederick, okay. which I think is interesting. I'm looking at the records at the National Archives. There was a wonderful researcher there, Mike Music, and he turned me on to these provost marshal records from Frederick that John Burns's name was included in as working as a teamster. Interesting. And, you know, the soldiers, what are they getting paid, $13 a month? Uh-huh. Is that what you guys Something understand? Like that, yeah. He's getting $20 a month. Really? He's doing a little better. Huh? 
but he rides a wagon and he follows along with Company E, the Second Pennsylvania. And when they head into uh, Virginia um, near Martinsburg, he is in range of the guns at the Battle of Falling Waters. Okay. And which I I maintain is the closest that he ever came to combat prior to the Battle of Gettysburg on July 1st. Yeah. So, you know, he... uh, um, we have accounts of him. Um, he is in the town on June 26th when Juber Oi comes through. Um, there is an account that suggests, and again, I think he's telling the story, that on June 26th, Juber Early arrives in town and writes a demand for supplies mm-hmm. and sends that demand to David Kendahart, mm-hmm. the president of the town council. Mm-hmm. He's the one who ends up with it because the Burgess has fled and the other members of the council aren't around. So Burgess is the mayor. Yeah. So he gets he ends up um, giving it to David Kendahart. And David Kendahart turns to John Burns, who is one of his employees in the cowboying business, apparently. Mm-hmm. And Burns delivers the message to Juba early. Interesting. And then according to Burns, because of that, they throw him in his own jail and lock him up. <laughs> and so he's in jail. Is this true? Well, he's not constable at that time. Right. So I, I, I don't know. But that's one of the stories. There's a lot of stories yeah. associated with Burns in this time. And again, it's, it's, it's um, hard to sort them out. Um, and some of the stories, you know, I, I lay out in the book that people told, and you can just prove they're not true. Like on June 27th, it's claimed that he captures a Confederate spy named William Gwynn, who's riding through the town with a message mm-hmm. for, um, uh, from Lee to Juba Early. Okay. And there is a person captured in the town on that day who's bringing a message through. Right. The 27th. Yeah, I think on the 27th. But it's not William Gwynn. William Gwynn is the man from the Union Cavalry unit that actually captured Does the, the guy. Does the capturing. Okay. Does the capturing. He's not the Confederate. So. And I doubt if Burns has anything to do with it. But um, Burns, on the morning of July 1st, uh, um, one of the things I tried to do was set up a timeline of John Burns. Right. Um, I don't have any good stories about him on June 30th. But one thing I noticed with John Burns is his statue is near the area where uh, the iron brigade uh went into action on july 1st yes and uh on battlefield tours you drive around the corner on stone avenue and one of the first monuments you come to is john burns Mm -hmm. and i think because of that and because you know in 1903 they dedicated the monument that spot put up in 1902 and people talk about him early in the tours but they always talk about him in association with their description of the morning action the first day Mm mm-hmm And one thing I wanted to try to, one thing I realized right away is John Burns is not in the morning action. He doesn't fight until the afternoon action with Stone's Brigade and the Iron Brigade. And yet book after book after book after book has him in the morning action. Okay. And it's just because of the placement of his monument at that site. All right. Yeah. And so things like that I wanted to dispel. So in the... In my analysis of it, what I do is I break it out into different phases of his activities on the day that made him famous. Uh, Early in the morning, he's about 8 a.m., he's in front of his house, and he has a famous argument with his neighbors. So he's jumping up and down, running around, yelling at his neighbors. And then he makes his way out to the seminary, and he spends much of the morning standing in front of the Lutheran Theological Seminary. They don't have the same steps they do now. Right, so right. He could have been on the steps. He could have been in front of it. But he is probably there in front of the building yelling and screaming as the Iron Brigade comes across the field and goes into battle. Okay. And then after the law and the morning action, he goes back into town. And somehow, he obtains a musket. That's a whole other story mm-hmm. we can talk about. So, um, he decides to then join in the fighting line. So in the law of the battle, and, you know, again, we're not sure what time it is, probably um, noon, he goes out to Chambersburg Pike, and he comes across the field near the McPherson farm, and he comes up to the back of the 150th Pennsylvania. 
and he tries to join that unit. And they talk to him for a while. There's some jocularity and, you know, the accounts of the soldiers and how funny this is. But they suggest that he go and fight with the 7th Wisconsin. So he goes off and he finds the 7th Wisconsin and he tries to join the 2nd Wisconsin, the 7th Wisconsin about um, 1 p.m. on the afternoon of July 1st, I figure. And there's, I have tons of accounts of him with members of the 7th Wisconsin. We're fortunate that John White Johnston lived at a time where a lot of veterans mm. were alive. Yeah. And he made it known that he wanted to interview and contact or talk to anyone who met with John Burns. So he has perhaps a dozen accounts of members of the Iron Brigade of the 150th Pennsylvania in their own writing, in their own hand and letters, talking about their encounter with Burns that day. And you have this? And I went to the Rochester Museum, oh. Historical you know, okay. Museum and Science Center, and I looked at these things. Yes, and I made yeah. copies of them. Yes, I have in a file in my office. <laughs> no one had ever used them in any book. That's crazy. Besides the fact that John Burns has mentioned these accounts, it's a awesome uh, yeah. resource for Iron Brigade historians sure. writing about the- Because I'm sure they the talked about thing. more than just John they Burns, right? They talk about right? more. Like oh, wow. Oliver Rood has just uh, a like thirty-page letter in there, um, but there's uh, he's with the seventh. But there's a lot of good accounts of the South of Wisconsin, and then of course the fighting breaks out, and someone suggested he go forward with the uh, the advanced company of Seventh Wisconsin near where the Seventh Wisconsin Monument is today, and um, he fights there until he's wounded several times, and the Iron Brigade's driven back, and then. As he comes out of the edge of the woods, near where Reynolds was killed, he's shot in the leg. He hobbles along, and he drops. And he lays on the ground all night long. Early the next morning, he comes to, and he's taken. And I'll, go, I'll talk a little more about these different things, uh, these phases of the battle, if you like. But he's taken over to the Chambersburg hut. Uh, Pike, and he rests on the cellar door of a house. Hmm. And some of the Southerners go to neighbors around and say, hey, this uh, guy named John Burns, one of your neighbors, got wounded in fighting, is laying over here. Somebody should do something about it. Um, one of my favorite accounts is there's a guy in the 7th Wisconsin, and he's with Burns. And Burns is wounded, and Burns drops, and he stops by him for a second. And Burns tells him, you know, he'd already talked to him, told him where he lived at the edge of the town. Could you tell my wife that she's going to have to come out and get a wagon and get me? <laughs> so this guy from the 7th Wisconsin, you can imagine, on the retreat, is retreating down Chambersburg Street, looks over and sees this house at the edge of the town with the big high, hor uh, high porch. And apparently Burns had mentioned the house. And so he runs up to the door, knocks on the door, and Mrs. Burns comes to the door huh. and he tells him that John has been wounded and you know, he would like her to do something, get a wagon or something, and come out and get him. And she says, I told him not to go out there. <laughs> <laughs> That's in one of these letters of the 7th Wisconsin guys. <sighs> and she doesn't go get him. Eventually, <laughs> sometime on the afternoon of the second day, the Zellinger family, who are his next-door neighbors, come in a wagon with a blind horse. They had fled from the town on the morning of July 2nd, kind of rode around north and west of the town. They're coming back into town towards the evening of July 2nd, and they pick up Burns, and they take him back to his house. And then on July 3rd, uh, he's convalescing in his house. On July 4th, you know, the Southern Army retreat back to Seminary Ridge. The Northern Army occupy the edge of the town, and that's when someone tries to assassinate John Burns. Oh, no. What? Yeah. The Confederates set up marksmen and fire through his window, and he dives out of the bed onto his floor to avoid oh, being no, assassinated. Oh, no, with all those wounds? So, so, you know, there's all kinds of... Each one of these things is filled with a dramatic story. Right. I mean... As if the story is not dramatic Right, enough. right. He's got to get And of course, you know, obviously the thing that really happens to Burns that really puts the candles on the cake is the fact that a reporter from the New York Times in a dispatch 
I think on like uh, July 7th, mentions John Burns was wounded in the fighting, ran out in the battle, had a gun, and was wounded in the fighting. And um, Matthew Brady, who arrived in Gettysburg maybe on, um, uh, you know, we don't know exactly the day, uh, maybe on uh, the 11th, uh -huh. uh, July 11th, somehow maybe he read the New York uh, uh, reporter's uh, mention of it. Uh, maybe he just heard it from somebody else, learns of John Burns' story, goes to his house, takes a photograph of him in front of his house, and, of course, that famous photograph of him on the rocking chair in front of the porch. And then when Matthew Brady's photographs are reprinted in the uh, Harper's Weekly, I think it's like the August 22nd or 23rd issue of Harper's Weekly, um, John Burns ends up on the front cover. Hmm. And it's like being on Time Magazine. Sure. Everybody wants to meet him and everybody knows who he is. He's finally and made it. Abraham Lincoln read Harper's Weekly. Mm -hmm. And when Lincoln comes to give the Gettysburg Address four months later, after the speech, when Lincoln returns to the Wills House, he asks if uh, a party of deputized uh, citizens would go down to Burns' house and bring him up so he can meet him. <laughs> now, Burns was in the crowd during the Gettysburg Address. Okay. So, but Burns was at his house. They found him. And according to the one account, you know, Burns is like, oh, he can come down here and meet me if he wants to. <laughs> but they, they convinced Burns to come down, and yeah. Burns comes into the center of the town. And yeah. see, some of these things happen, mm -hmm. and they take the notice of a lot of spectators. So... At mm. Lincoln was just walking out of the Wells House. He was on his way down to the Presbyterian Church to, to uh, go to the political rally that was put on by the Ohio delegation of uh, the Soldiers National Cemetery. And he, he meets Burns. He shakes his hand in front of dozens of reporters mm -hmm. and gives him the thanks of the country. Okay. And then Burns and Lincoln walk down the street together, and Burns goes in the Presbyterian Church and sits in the same same pew with Abraham Lincoln when um, Charles Anderson, the Lieutenant Governor of Elective Ohio, gives the speech. And uh, of course, you know that is a key part of the story. And then, and I don't know the exact reason for this, and I don't know the connection. But um, Congress reconvenes in December of 1863. And as soon as Congress convenes, I think, and again, I'd have to read my book to find out the name, a senator from um, New Hampshire, I think it is, um, stands up and proposes bill number one, a pension for John Burns of Gettysburg. Wow. And it passes through both houses. And in February, President Lincoln signs the bill. Really? And, and John Burns comes to Washington. And dozens of reporters see this event occur. Huh. And one of the reporters writes an article about it. And this article travels through the newspapers and makes its way to a California newspaper. And a San Francisco newspaper man reads the article about John Burns of Gettysburg and writes a poem about him. <laughs> and that guy, his name is Francis Bret Hart, one of the, the greatest, wrestler. yeah, one of the greatest American poets. And that poem is what made John Burns famous. So all these other things led to that large amount of attention he was getting. Hmm. But that poem became, it printed and reprinted and people knew it. But the guy who wrote the poem didn't know Burns and didn't know anything about the story, but what he read in the paper. Right. But the poem made him famous. And then he became somewhat of a national celebrity. This is, I didn't know he had a pension. Yeah. He's Good got for a pension. Him. Good for him. A special pension. Special pension just for John Burns. Yeah. And um, what's interesting about it was the poem is published in 64. 
and then Burns goes on the tour circuit. And actually, it was in December of 63 that David McConaughey of Gettysburg lectures on the battle. I think if, if I'm maybe in Philadelphia and maybe in New York City and mm-hmm. takes Burns with him. And he gives a lecture about the battle and what happened during the battle. And then Burns would come out wearing the outfit that he wore during the fighting, carrying the musket that he carried in the battle. Uh-huh. Probably not the same musket. Yeah. And gives a little patriotic speech. And people love it. And Burns had his photograph recorded at the Tyson Brothers studio. Right. He was selling photographs of himself in the crowd at Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. We know that. Yeah. Um, you could meet John Burns after the lectures, and then he would sign his photograph and sell it to you. He, he then hooked up with the United States Sanitary Commission. And you probably know that the Sanitary Commission had fairs in Philadelphia, for instance, yeah. in which they would have like, amputees talking about their battle experiences and um, there would be trophies and battle flags and John Burns would give a little speech, a patriotic speech, and it would help raise money to care for the wounded soldiers. Hmm. Do, do you, have you seen it? Are there any copies of these speeches that exist still? Um, I have one. Okay. Yes. There was a New Is York. Is it good? Um, oh, I can find it, I'm sure. But um, um, in the one from um, the, the, the where somebody actually wrote down what he said, he talks about being wounded seven times and he describes his wounds. Yeah, that's another thing. We, we, we talked about on, uh, I think, the last Ask a Guide about myths. Um, you're certain he was not shot four times, I think is what... That's, right. <laughs> that's the only amount of times to. I have that we know that he wasn't shot. <laughs> yeah. So, but he's been shot any other number of times. Up to seven? Is seven the most? Yeah, seven okay. is the most. Seven is the most. I, I don't think seven's enough. I think three is enough. <laughs> I always thought it was three. So I think I was like, wow. And, you know, he's like, how old is he at the time of the battle? 69? He's an old guy. Yeah, he's 69 years old. It's not a spring chicken. So let's see, I'm looking. I, I don't know if I could find the actual um, thing I have in here, but I do have an actual uh, one of those times where he, spe- he speaks and uh, the person writes down what he says or, or tries to, you know, obviously in that day and age when somebody gives a little speech, you know, or a porter's trying to do like shorthand and then writes it out later. If you look at the accounts yeah. of the Gettysburg Address by people doing this, you can see um, the differences in them. But uh, it is fascinating that we do have this, uh, this one account. So let's see. Well, if you don't find it, we can look for it during the break. And then, uh, uh, okay, so. Do we have, uh, now I told you a little bit about the story. I can go into a little more detail on different aspects of it. Uh, um, We'll finish him off before we answer questions. But so um, he ends up after the war selling his house. Okay. And then telling people he's homeless. And the person who bought it said that he sold it so, because he could tell people that he couldn't, you know, have his house, you know, his wife had died in 1868. Okay. And so he kind of meanders around and uh, for a while he is given a job as, I don't know exactly what you call it, but the sergeant at arms at the door of the Pennsylvania State Senate. Wow. And so as the senators are entering, this- entering, he would shake their hand and give them a little speech and, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> and they paid him to do that. And that's how Samuel Bates, uh, the famous Pennsylvania historian, came to know him and wrote an account of his life based on his discussions with him that appeared in Bates's history of the Pennsylvania, the you know the um, yeah the Werther the, the, Rebellion, and he wrote kind of a history of Pennsylvania. Um, wh- wh- when uh, when was that? When did he? He published in 1875. When did he work there? No, when did he work there? Yeah. Um, well, I think I think it's like 1868. And again, okay. that's something I'd have to I'd have to look through. I'm so sure he leaves it. Gettysburg. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, he does travel uh, from Harrisburg, and he's in Philadelphia. Time, you know, you can look in these various. Now that we have newspapers. Mm. Uh, dot com. And, yeah. You can find him in Philadelphia giving lectures. You can find him in New York City. So he travels on the East Coast, but he travels from city to city. Hmm. And uh, I think it's 66. 
He's in Pittsburgh, and if it, the Pittsburgh City Council gives him a presentation cane that has a really nice inscription on it, mm. and we have that cane at the Adams County Historical Society. Oh, that's awesome. He's given to him by uh, Pittsburgh for his... Uh, and on the front of my book, there's a really cool photograph of John Burns. Yes. That's actually from Chicago. Oh, really? So I don't have an account of his lecture in Chicago, but we have photographs of him. And when he'd go to a different city, he would go to the photographic studio, and they would take his photograph. And then that photographic distributor could sell the photographs. I'm sure Burns got a cut. Sure, I'm sure he did. But because of this, we have a huge collection of photographs of John Burns. Just really? a huge collection. Oh, man, I wish the yeah, I really wish the video software was working so that people could see this. We'll have to we'll we'll have to we'll do another show eventually where we could do this, but uh, yeah, that's awesome. But I have a large amount of photographs. Um, a couple, I couldn't even tell you how many photographs are taken of Burns. Yeah, look at that. Okay, that's the front of the house. Oh, that's the drawing. Yeah, when I was trying to find stills to actually like put into the video while we were doing it, mm -hmm. I yeah. found tons. So of the, John Burns the other photos. thing that made him famous, yeah, was uh, N. C. Wyeth, the famous. Pennsylvania illustrator who did the drawings for, um, uh, you know, Treasure Island. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, his Long John Silver uh, is a postage stamp, I believe. Is it Long John Silver? It's the other. Yeah, Long John Silver is in, in Treasure in, Island. On the, postage, in the, on the postage stamp. But um, he did John Burns at Gettysburg. But his painting is based on the poem. And okay. in a little error that um, Bret Hart misunderstood, Bret Hart has him in the battle wearing a white beaver fur hat mm. <laughs> from an albino beaver. From an albino. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that looks kind of ridiculous. It's a phenomenal painting. I love it. <laughs> it is it, a cool painting, yeah, it's though. Like, it's like Uncle Sam marching forward. That's, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. He's, wearing, he's wearing the uniform. And the, using the musket he used in the War of 1812. Now, you know, let's talk about the musket. Because there's, sure. there's some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Confusion, maybe? Discrepancies? Contradictory. Contra well, let me give you an overview of the musket yes. as I see it. Okay, go ahead. And I do this in the back. I have an appendix on it. And, you know, you have to forgive me if you just read the book. Because this is, I, I don't know when the last time I read the book is. So <laughs> my memory of it. But, uh. He's on the battlefield early on the first day. Okay. And he's jumping up and down and he's holding a musket. And quite possibly, he is holding a musket that is a flintlock that will later appear in the photographs with him back at the house when Matthew Brady is there. Mm -hmm. So he has a flintlock musket, he's jumping up and down, he's and he's he's encouraging the troops on. And then he goes back into the edge of the town. And according to the accounts, he comes across a soldier. In one account, it's a wounded member of Buford's cavalry, and he gets a carbine. In another account, it's a soldier who's wounded coming in from the field, and he gets a musket from him. So at that point, he puts his flint lock away, and he carries the musket that he obtained with the ammunition out to Chambersburg Pike onto the battlefield. He runs up to the 150th Pennsylvania, and every single account of every man in the 150th Pennsylvania says he's carrying a flintlock musket okay. when he gets there. All right. They talk to him. They say, sure, you can fight out here with us, but maybe you want to go over to the second, 7th Wisconsin. They take away his flintlock musket, and they give him one of their muskets and a pocket full of ammunition. Okay. And then he leaves them, and he goes over to the 7th Wisconsin. And when he gets to the 7th Wisconsin, every man in the unit says he's carrying a flintlock musket. <laughs> okay. And then they talk to him a few minutes. I think they give him an Austrian. I think, um, uh, the uh, did, did they, Eric, do they have Austrians? It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lorenz, that's kind of popular in the Iron Brigade. So, so they take away his flintlock musket. They give him that musket. And then he goes out to the firing line. And there's a couple accounts that suggest he's on the firing line before Pettigrew and Brock and Brawl's brigades attack. And there's one great account where somebody's like, uh, have you ever fired that musket before? He's like, well, you know, he's talking and he said, okay, you see that guy riding on a horse? Can you hit him? And then, you know, he fires his musket and he just drops somebody in his saddle. And it's General Reynolds. Away. Yeah. yeah. So, or whoever, whoever <laughs> it might be. But 
apparently, he, you know, so after all this, he's wounded in the fighting, and we know he's wounded um, out near the 7th Wisconsin Monument, wounded at the edge of the tree line. I would say he's definitely wounded, too, perhaps three times. Right. But it's a leg wound. It brings him down. Then he is scared that the Southerners might uh, figure out he's fighting in the battle. So he throws his musket as far as he can away, and he buries his ammunition under him, and he rolls over the spots. They won't know he's a combatant. With seven bullet wounds. And then when the Confederates find him laying on the ground, they ask him what he was doing out there, and they question him. Right. And in, there are several different accounts of what he says according to his own accounts. Okay. One of them was that his wife was sick, and he needed to get medicine from the doctor because he's afraid his wife's going to die. <laughs> And he was wandering, he got wandered between the two lines of battle and got wounded while he was on his way to get to medicine. And of course, another account says that he was looking for his cow, that his cow right. escaped, and he wandered between the lines and he got wounded while he was looking for his cow. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's various accounts of that. And then he crawls back to the house, you know, the nearest house, the Riggs house, which is a pretty good crawl. You know what I've never done? <laughs> Crawled it? I've never crawled the area. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have to do that we'll this summer, to Tim. That. that might be, you could video, <laughs> you could videotape me and see how long it takes. Yeah, let's do it. Well, let's go crawl the, let's go crawl from uh, the area that he was shot at. He shot, he's laying right behind uh, Reynolds, Reynolds Avenue, in front of Reynolds, would you say, near the monument to um, Gilbert Reynolds, the okay. artillery monument. And so he crawls over to the Riggs house, which is, you know, where Lee's headquarters is. Oh, okay. And um, then he lays there and he's taken into town. He surely doesn't have a musket with him. No. So when John, when uh, Matthew Brady arrives a couple weeks later, or 10 days later, whenever it might be, um, he takes a photograph with John Burns and the musket that he used in the battle. But clearly, that's not the musket he used in the battle. Yeah. It can't be. Right. Did he go out and get it? Did he go find it? Did he bring I mean, it back? That's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. But I tell you what, that musket behind him in that rock and share photograph is the musket that today is in the State Museum in Harrisburg on display. Okay. And the tag is kind of confusing, but the tag clearly indicates that John Burns told whoever bought the musket from him that that's his War of 1812 musket. Okay. And not the musket he was using in the battle. But that musket is the musket that appears behind him. And we know all this because um, a ramrod is missing, I think, and uh, there's uh, it's cut off. The um, What do you call that, Eric, when the rifles? Yeah, they, they have the stock cut at the, uh, like the lower band. But nowadays you call it like a duffel cut. When, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's a duffel cut, Tim. Yeah, and you can compare that negative of that musket, right, with the, in the Rock and Share view with the the one they have at Harrisburg, and it's clearly that musket. Okay. So, and then the Adams County Historical Society, we received a musket from Grant Johnson, John Wade Johnson's son, who bought it from a local. Uh huh. That is the musket that he oh, used to the no. battle. Also. Oh no. Yes. Oh, boy. Well, you know, maybe he was doing it Hollywood style and he had a musket under each arm. He's going out there. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there are aspects of the story that are interesting and um, are con uh, contradicting. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that he went out and fought in the battle and was wounded in the fighting. That's right. the clear no, yeah. story. There's plenty of accounts saying that yeah. he did that. Yeah. Including. So, but why the confusion about the 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 number of wounds that he received. Well, to, to me, the, the confusion stems from the fact that if you're a soldier and you get a pension, what do they make you do, Eric, when you get a pension? Oh, you have to go get, uh, you know, you have to go get a full physical, physical. And, and all kinds of tests. Every, okay. I'm sure that most of the listeners might not realize this, but I spent a lot of time <clears throat> in the National Archives as a youth looking through the uh, pension records of right. the First Army Corps. I have just a huge amount of them. And uh, all of them are filled with these wild-looking, um, not only surgeons' descriptions, but diagrams with arrows showing where the bullet went through and oh, where the bullets wow. were lodged. Really? Yeah. Guess what? 
John Burns get a special pension. He doesn't, we don't have a single medical exam yeah. in his pension records. Because it was an act they of Congress. Him. They just yeah. gave it to him they as, a, to as him. a thing. Yeah. He doesn't have to get a medical exam. How much was the pension for? Good, good question. I'd have to look that up. Okay. I think early on the pensions were $8 a month. Okay. So he collected a pension from uh, 1864 until his death in 1872. So um, I, that, that's probably an easy question if I had, uh, if I had my uh, stuff in front of me. All right, that's but fine. But I do not, I do not know. All right, well, so um, when does he die? Where does he die? Uh, he died in Bonneville. Oh, Again, so he made about, his way back to the yeah, area. He, um, his wife was from Bonneville. Yeah. And um, uh, he died, uh, I think it's off the top of my head, I'll, I'll look, but it's, I think it's like February 2nd, um, 1872. Okay. Um, I'm sure I have it. In so not quite a decade after the Battle of yeah. Gettysburg. So he only and, had and nine years to enjoy himself. He's brought back and he's buried in Evergreen Cemetery. Yep. Uh, beside his wife, who died um, in 1868. So let's see. Uh, let's see his will. He died on February 4th, 1872 at age 78. Okay. So the fourth. And he, uh, his grave has an American flag that flies over it, right? Yeah. Um, John yeah. White Johnston in 1917, I believe it was. Uh, There's an interesting story that John Burns made a will in January, uh, mid-January 1872, and left all his money to the Methodist Church. Okay. But Pennsylvania had passed a law that you can't give all your money to the church on your deathbed. All right. So you have to have it in writing in a will first, is what you're saying? Y yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and a will has to be made a few prior months to dying. prior. You can't. Too many people are doing that. Okay. And their relatives, of course, I'm sure their relatives are the ones that help get this bill passed. Sure, yeah. <laughs> hey, you, you want to, you you, you're trying to make sure you go to heaven so you get all your money to the church. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, uh, his will was found <laughs> void. It was voided because it was made too close to the time of his death. So his money went to his grandchild and didn't go to um, the church. But he, but John White Johnson convinced the Methodist Church, hey, and he also uh, talked to the Presbyterian Church in Gettysburg and said, you know, Burns was going to um, leave his money to you guys. So could you help me? And the churches got together. They helped. And with the GAR, put a stone on his grave and they made sure uh, a flag post was put on his grave. And, um, uh, and the flag flies over his grave 24 hours a day. Yeah. Um, you mentioned his grandson. His granddaughter. What? Granddaughter, his adopted daughter's daughter. Okay, or his daughter, or his. <laughs> whatever happened to her and the so baby? The um, we don't know what happened to his daughter. She disappeared. The adopted daughter was raised by. Remember, she's born in sixty two. Right. So Martha or Barbara, his wife. Martha's her mother. Mm -hmm. uh, Gilbert. Uh, the granddaughter died in eighteen sixty eight. Burns put his granddaughter in a, um, a boarding home in Gettysburg for a time and paid someone to take care of her. Okay. He died in 72. The estate paid for that for a while. Then she ended up moving to Washington State. She married a guy from Westminster, Maryland, if I um, uh, remember correctly, and they moved to Washington State. And John Wade Johnson was able to correspond with the granddaughter and buy items from her. I think hmm. he got the cane that he got from the city of Philadelphia from uh, her. And then eventually, John Wade Johnson's son gave that cane to the Historical Society. Okay. Through Douglas Harder, who is one of the people that I um, dedicated the book to. Mike Lentz, uh, patron, you have any questions over there? You're just sitting in and enjoying the show? All right, very good. All right, so we're going to take a quick break right now. Those of you watching, uh, hang tight. And we're going to come back, and we're going to take uh, questions from our patrons. And then if we have any time, we will take some questions from the people in the Peanut Gallery on Facebook. Um, make them good. I've seen some good ones coming in, but uh, make some better. So we'll be right back. 
I'll tell you what, this might come in handy if the lockdowns continue throughout the winter. Plowman Cider is a proud sponsor of Addressing Gettysburg and wants to offer our listeners the chance to bring Adams County's delicious agricultural countryside to the comfort of your own home this winter. Grown and fermented on Plowman's seventh generation family farm, their heirloom and bittersweet apple varieties will soothe you right down to the ground. You can get Plowman Cider on Gettysburg's historic Lincoln Square at their tap room or have it shipped to your home by visiting plowmancider.com. Addressing Gettysburg listeners can use the coupon code CIDERPOD at checkout to enjoy 15% off your order. So put a taste of Adams County in your glass this winter with Plowman Cider. Go to plowmancider.com and use promo code CIDERPOD for 15% off. That's P-L-O-U-G-H-M-A-N-C-I-D-E-R dot com. You must be 21 years of age and shipping is subject to your state's regulations. Our favorite bookstore in Gettysburg is For the Historian, located at 42 York Street. Isn't it, Eric? You're darn tootin', Matt. (laughs) It's because they have the best selection of Civil War books in Gettysburg, both new and used. And online, they have even more books to choose from. But Matthew, what if the Civil War is simply not my thing? Not a problem, my fine four-fendered friend. This is for the historian, after all. They cover history from the ancient world to the 21st century with a strong selection of World War II and American Revolution books. It's astounding how they squeeze thousands of titles from Osprey, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more into their store. And it's also astounding how you and I both squeeze into our pants every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, handsome, they have a warehouse, too, and that's where they keep all those books that are available online at ForTheHistorian.com. And folks, if you go to ForTheHistorian.com now and order books until you're blue in the face, be sure you mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund your shipping costs. What if I prefer to browse in the store and don't want to go online to get my books? Great question, Doodlebug. Just mention Addressing Gettysburg at checkout, and they'll take 20% off the retail price of your item. So go to ForTheHistorian.com, stop by 42 York Street, or call 717-685-5207. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717 717- 685-5207. Getty's Bike Tours has something uh, special for you. It's a special offer that they've got uh, going on. If you call 717-752-7752 and you make a reservation by April 20th of 2021, you're going to get 15% off the tour reservation. Now, this is for tours only, not for rentals. So you got to make sure that you call 717-752-7752 before or by April 20th to receive that 15% off of your tour. Your tour can be any time in the 2021 season, but you got to make the reservation by April 20th. 15% off, you got to call 717-752-7752. Someone will get back to you if they don't pick up, and you will let them know that you heard about them on Address in Gettysburg, and they'll give you 15% off. You know how I know this? Because it was my idea. Think outside the bus. 717-752-7752. That's 717-752-7752. For those of you who prefer it that way, 717-752-7752. Gettysburg, a nation divided. The battle that changed America. Avatars. Generals. Artifacts. Games. 360 degree views. An immersive battlefield experience. A new way to discover history. Gettysburg, a nation divided. An augmented reality narrated by Scott Eastwood. Download it from your phone's app store today and support addressing Gettysburg by entering GBurg1863 in the referral code prompt after downloading. You're listening to The Addressing Gettysburg Podcast with Matt Callery. Okay, and we're back now, and that was just a wonderful commercial break. Um, We're going to get into some questions now that are sent in by our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Best way to support the show. You get a lot of extra stuff, too, and we just launched our first lieutenant. Mike, you're a first lieutenant now, right? Yes, I am. Mike, what do you get as a first lieutenant? I don't know. Okay, thanks a lot, Mike. (laughs) 
you, <laughs> very informative. What an advocate. Well, you get videos uh, when the computer works. <laughs> uh, we videotape all of our interviews and things. So you get the video version of what uh, uh, the, the lower ranks here over on Patreon.com plus some other things. Once we get this thing uh, in in working order, we're going to do uh, live streams of the interviews. We're going to do live streams of, uh, you know, just kind of like getting to know people, stuff like that. So that's all available over at patreon.com. You can go from a dollar, three dollars, five dollars, 15 or twenty five dollars now. And uh, each uh, each one comes with its own bag of joy. Uh, before we get to the questions, though, Tim, you were saying uh, during the break that uh, there might be there might be a movie being made about uh, John Burns based on so, your book. So one of the interesting thing, things that uh, um, you know happened with John Burns, it's John Burns is not my best selling book. So it, it you know although I think the story is interesting and I really uh, like the way the book turned out and. Um, you know, uh, I spent a lot more time with it than uh, some of my other projects. Uh, you know, it didn't make me a lot of money. Well, you wait until after this show airs, okay. and then it's going to yeah. be a New York Times bestseller. So uh, Mike Lentz is going to buy it. So uh, <laughs> one of the interesting things that happened was uh, one day out of the blue, I guess it's been um, a couple years ago now, uh, American Battlefield Trust got a... Uh, email from a lawyer in Los Angeles. Okay. And it was asking, you know, if they knew me, because, you know, I'm on American Battlefield Trust uh, videos sometimes, mm -hmm. and if I could get in contact with me, and they sent me her number, you know, it was, it was you know, kind of, it wasn't, at first it was kind of a secret. And um, she contacted me and said that she had someone who was interested in buying the movie rights to my book. Okay. And, uh, uh, I think I probably thought it was a joke. You know, in the Gettysburg area, um, there's only like, you know, two or three Civil War authors that I know that have sold movie rights to their book. And one of them, of course, being Jeff Shara. Big one. lives down the road, sure. obviously. Yeah. You know, he's sold some uh, movie rights. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, sure enough, uh, the owner of the production company called me and said they wanted to make a movie uh, out of my book. So they purchased the movie rights to the book, of course, and um, they advertised it. It's Bristol Pictures, and you can get on their website and look, and they have a project underway. It's called Brave John Burns. And uh, I'm not exactly sure how they'll handle his story, but I think the the basis of the story is the actions on July 1st and how the things uh, that were going on in his life led to his actions on July 1st. Okay. Just a basic story of John Burns. Should be interesting. Yeah. And um, – they asked me, uh, they purchased the movie rights, and then they asked if I would work as, uh, you know, on the script like a, with the guy. Oh, well, and, okay, yeah. And uh, as, a, you know, kind of a historian. Um, and, um, you know, sure, I, I never thought about somebody buying the movie rights to one of my books. Yeah, I'm that's a, cool. I'm a Civil War author. You know, right, just right. A historian, it doesn't happen. So, uh, sure. And, um, but of course, COVID hit, you yeah. know, so uh, it's kind of, I'm sure that, uh, Hollywood hasn't been uh, active as active in the last year as it's been. So, no, no, it hasn't. So, uh, hopefully, it'll get going again. But uh, they continue to uh, renew the contract for the movie rights. That's a good sign. And um, uh, so, uh, I'm uh, hopeful that in the next few years, uh, this will get done. Now, I don't look for it to be like a uh, feature f film in the movies. I think they're looking for something like that they can show at a film festival. Okay. They make uh, um, movies that, uh, uh, and you can look at the titles of the movies you get on the website. Bristol you, you know who would be good is John Burns. Who uh, now? If if I had a John Burns, okay. who would I envision who would you pick? as John Burns? I would probably pick somebody like uh, Sam Elliott. <laughs> Well, of course. Who, who wouldn't? But you know, who might be uh, good? Get off my lawn. <laughs> you got one of the uh, get off my lawn shirts. Nice. Nice. So Clint Eastwood, you know. Clint he's Eastwood? Old, old yeah. He's a couple years older than uh, uh, Tom Berenger 
is can play a cranky old man pretty well. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So haven't haven't thought about uh, who they might get to to play John Burns. Mm-hmm. I'm sure just a couple of yeah ideas that we gave him right there. Let's see if they but, can uh, go get him. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, good luck with that. I hope that uh, now, I did see works Sam Elliott recently in a movie. Uh, was it called? Um, what was it called? A star is born. I killed Hitler and then Bigfoot. Oh yeah. What? Yeah, it, it was it was a movie about the guy who killed Hitler, and then he hunted down the Bigfoot and killed the Bigfoot. Well, if you could do one, I would imagine you'd be able to do the other. Jeez, so, Sam you know, Elliott, I, think I that was killed around, Hitler and then Bigfoot. Yeah, I think that was around the time of uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer oh, too. Sounds like it. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, well, that was relatively new, right? Or that's not an older movie. That was like. 10 oh, or 15 is, years yeah, old? Yeah, okay. 10, 15 years ago. Okay. What, oh, Time geez. flies, Tim. Time I just flies. saw it. I, I thought it was new because I never heard of no, it. No, no. I don't okay. think that's new. <laughs> All right. Let's go to our first question here from Rick Fish. He says, hi, Matt. I always enjoy Tim's discussion. Always interesting. Thanks. Was John Burns the only Gettysburg citizen soldier defending Gettysburg? If so, why did others not defend the town? Are there other examples of residents uh, resisting the occupation? Well, sure. I mean, we have other accounts of civilians fighting the battle. Let me, you know, hmm. the whole question, I, 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 um, usually the question is brought up, um, and the, he did have one, like, half sentence in there that was in this vein, to pick on the Gettysburg civilians. If so, why so, did others not defend the town, that yeah, one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, why don't unarmed citizens go out <laughs> and fight against battle hardened right. Confederate Confederates? Veterans? Why don't right. they do that? Yes. Why don't the women and children take knives and spades and pitchforks and fight the Confederates right. off? Yeah. Because it works so would, well on the 26th. Yeah, yeah, well, well, that one fella had to go pick beans, wasn't it? Oh, Mr. Uh, Broadhead yeah, yeah. Went and got, yeah. got a <laughs> beans because he didn't so, want the Reds no, to I, go. I guess the, that I guess, was his way of fighting. I guess uh, even Pennsylvania militia didn't kind of work out for him. They have no, guns, and they, they, guns. And they can't defend themselves against— They had guns in a few you days know, the of other training. Thing, the other thing about it is, here's something interesting. And, you know, I'm sure when I talk about John Burns, I, I think that sometimes people are surprised because they expect me to be, like, overflowing with— uh, you know, glory at his story. And I, there was a professor at Gettysburg College who asked me to speak on John Burns, and I spoke to his class on John Burns, and afterwards he didn't like it at all. Really? Because I wasn't consistently pointing out John Burns' patriotism. I, or, or Gettysburg I, College? Maybe, maybe I seem a little snarky with my uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> my... Um, use of the word. Some people would say that I have a Metallica view of the Civil War, that it's all skewed. That it, you know. <laughs> a Metallica view. <laughs> but anyway, um, but anyway um, let's examine John Burns in Virginia. Okay. Let's say a farmer in Virginia grabs a musket and fires at some Union soldiers riding by. Mm. They stop. They hang him mm. from a tree. He is a bushwhacker. Right. He is a terrorist. That's right. That's right. John Burns is not a soldier. He's not mustered into federal service. He mm. has no business fight. You're not supposed to cross that line, that imaginary line from civilian to soldier. Right. Because no. when he's a teamster, it's like essentially being like a government contractor. Well, it is, right? I mean, you're, you're not really in the Army. So anyway, anyway to get to the other the root of the question, we do have accounts of other people who were civilians that yeah. fought in the battle. Who? And, um, well, you know, there's a guy from Emmitsburg, a guy named Charles Weekly, you mm-hmm. may have heard of. Nope. And... Um, as the 12th Massachusetts Infantry is passing through Emmitsburg, Maryland, uh, a couple days before the battle, he falls in line with them. He stays with them. He appears at Gettysburg on the field of battle. They, you know, unofficially muster him to the muster him into the ranks, and he fights with the Union on July 1st. Um, you know, of course, you know, Gettysburg College, the 26th Emergency Regiment, you know, mm-hmm. did try to fight against the Confederates on June 26th. Right. So there's a whole bunch of townspeople. And there's townspeople. There's lots of townspeople in the Army. They're already in the Army. They're already yeah. in the Army. Yeah. Uh, there is a um, 
account on June 30th uh, that a citizen of Littlestown joins in with some of the cavalry units is involved in the fighting uh, at the edge of Hanover. Uh, David Gregg says that um, a guy joins his unit on July 2nd as they're coming th- or late on July 1st as they're coming through McSherry's town. Okay. And he calls them McSherry's town's John Burns. <laughs> and this unnamed citizen rides with the column, leads them to Gettysburg, and he sees him fighting on July 2nd in the uh, Long Prinkerhoff Ridge. There, the, Jesse Wheedleton just last night when we were recording, yeah. told us a story about a guy. Was it a Hanover guy? Uh, towards York. Somebody towards York. Like over uh, York. Somebody she knew. Oh, that's right. It was towards York. Somebody she knew out there uh, had a relative who uh, supposedly fought uh, and was and was. What was, what was the regiment? Twenty six Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, I th- not I, the PV. I think it was no, I th- I think it was PV. No, because I asked her, she said no. She said it was just twenty six Pennsylvania, right? So I don't think they were here, but yeah. Oh no, well, then maybe it wasn't the twenty six. They I ended don't, up adding him to the uh, PA memorial, but then took oh. him off in the seventies. In the nineteen seventies, wow. I do have an appendix in the book. Other civilians that fought, um, and uh, I mean, um, don't know exactly where that is. It's somewhere in there. I don't know if I, I mixed a major one, but. Um, uh, you know what? I don't have an appendix. Oh, you hear it. It's under civilians that fought. And there are accounts. Oh, there's a guy from Gettysburg College, um, James Watson, who actually joins in with the 9th New York Cavalry on July 1st. <laughs> there's a guy named uh, Frederick Lehman, uh, who uh, apparently fights with 151st um, from Gettysburg College. And um, there's a guy named Charles Greist, who's in um, York Springs. Uh, north of Gettysburg, and uh, there was a courier who was trying to deliver a message to Buford's Cavalry Command from Harrisburg, and on June 30th, he rides, that that guy is, uh, um, his horse goes lame, he falls off his horse, he injures himself, and Christ brings the message to Gettysburg to Buford's Command. Mm -hmm. And then on the morning of July 1st, he is still with Buford's Command, acting as a message runner, and he is... um, thrown off his horse and injured on July 1st and apparently tries to collect a pension later for this, for being wounded in the battle. He's a civilian. I, I think when you look into it deeper, I mean, it. Uh, there are scattered civilians who assist in many ways. And, you know, you could say they're involved in the battle mm-hmm. one way or another. Yeah. Uh, I know what you're doing. What? You. It's right here, 26 yep. Pennsylvania. Yep, I, see <laughs> I, that. I swore she said it, so I just either she was wrong or you were wrong. <laughs> yeah, weird. I was wrong. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah! Okay. Uh, let's see. Martin Husk is back for a couple more questions. Um, Says just a couple of questions for the John Byrne segment. Uh, this should really be fun conversation. It is a fun conversation. It's an interesting guy. Thanks for asking, Martin. Okay, number one, how much of what we know about John Burns is legend and how much is true? Um, and then also after the battle and the and the rise of Burns' celebrity, how was he received by his fellow townspeople? Yeah, he seems to be kind of jealous of Jenny Wade's. Well, Success, but or yeah. not success, but her fame. Uh, what do people think about him? Well, I, I think it's interesting that um, there, you, some people may not be aware of it, but after the Battle of Gettysburg was over and both armies left and then reporters descended upon the town, the town was filled with wounded soldiers. There was very little supplies. The townspeople were doing the best they could in a horrible situation. Gettysburg was like, a natural disaster Mm -hmm. and that the people were trying to recover from it. And there was a lack of food and it was wounded everywhere and nobody knew what to do and supplies were slow in coming in. And a couple of these reporters that came into the town afterwards, not all of them, most of them understood the situation, but a few of them were not the best uh, conveyors of uh, fact. Okay. Or, (laughs) and one of them, a guy named Lorenzo Krauts wrote a nasty article in the New York Times, and I think it appeared on July 9th, and he called the people of Gettysburg 
cowards. He pointed out that they were charging soldiers for you know food and yes. and that and that they were not patriotic and uh, you know and, and and it was really unnecessary because it was a really tough situation. It brought a lot of undue criticism yeah, against yeah. the townspeople. And after that, there were a barrage of articles in papers questioning the patriotism of the people in the town, which is kind of ridiculous because we are in Pennsylvania. We are in the North. Mm -hmm. Like 3,000 guys from Adams County are in the Union Army. Mm -hmm. Of course, we like to talk about Wesley Culp. Right. <laughs> Maybe five <laughs> of them were in the Confederate Army, but yeah. 3,005, I don't know what yeah. the percentage yeah, is there, yeah. but it's, a big it's difference. predominantly a Northern town. But it's a Democratic town when the state is controlled by the Republicans at that time. And, uh, you know, there's some political infighting mm. amongst the parties. And okay. uh, the editor of the Gettysburg newspaper, the Democratic editor, is arrested after the battle for supposedly harboring or helping Southerners find Union wounded in houses and taking to Fort McHenry. And it's totally <laughs> contrived as a political vendetta. But anyway, huh. John Burns loved this. And when he would go, when it be part of his lectures, he would say things like, you've heard of the cowards of Gettysburg. <laughs> while, while they were hiding in their basements, I <laughs> fought for my country. <laughs> so he was able to use what people knew or had heard negatively about the citizens and set himself apart from that. Okay. So because of that, he became very unpopular mm. in the town. Yeah. And the townspeople just simply didn't like him. And Bret Hart, remember we talked about Bret Hart's poem. Um, that's a very, very good poem. And um, uh, some of you may have heard the poem. I'll just read the couple, first couple lines. <clears throat> have you heard the story that gossips tell? Of John Burns of Gettysburg, no? Oh, well. Brief is the glory that hero earns. Brief are the story of poor John Burns. He was the fellow who won renowned. The only man in town that didn't back down. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the poem even has a line in it that's critical of the other citizens of Gettysburg. The mm. only man in town that didn't back down. So... As years go by, the townspeople come up with their own poem, uh -oh. a parody okay. of John Burns's poem, and they hand it around. And we have a little leaflet <clears throat> that was handed around during some of the reunions that the locals had printed up and they were handing out to people. Yes, we heard the stories gossip tells of John Burns of Gettysburg. Oh, well. <laughs> Among the people here, tis a conviction. Half of the tale is fact, the other half is fiction. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on and blasts the, the, the legend of John Burns. The, pro the problem is, uh, you know, people take it too far. <laughs> so like we said, sure, John Burns has some issues. But sure, you know, um, but he did actually go and fight a battle. The local townspeople insist that he never fought in a battle. Mm. One of his neighbors, a guy named uh, Dustman, uh, Henry Dustman, it lived up on Seminary Ridge where John Burns crawled to, crawled to um, on the morning of uh, July 2nd. He would tell people that, you know, John Burns never fought in a battle, that, you know, that it's all a fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we know that's not true. Yeah. And so do people take it too far? Like, like when people are like some tour guys like myself, because... We don't like to talk about Joshua Chamberlain. Mm. And so we sometimes go too far. Like, you know, we'll say things like, well, you know, he was wearing a dress under his uniform. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, you say things just that to you mess with the people are not true yeah. because you're overemphasizing the point. And, and a lot of these town people went a little bit too far with the John Burns thing. But, of course, John Burns did not enjoy sharing the limelight with other people. And of course, that's where it gets into the Jenny Wade thing. You know, there was a guy named um, Moore. Let's see what it was is his name, Frank Moore. And he was writing a book 
1866, it was called Women of the War. He didn't mm-hmm. write the book, and you can read the book. Okay. In the book, there's a chapter about Carrie Sheets of Gettysburg and how she hid the sword of Colonel Wheelock in the folds of her skirt and how she cared for the wounded. It's a very, very good book. Hmm. He didn't 1866 write. that was yeah, written? 1866. Wow, hear that, folks? 1866. He, he didn't know anybody in Gettysburg. He wanted to write about Jenny Wade. So he just wrote a letter to the postmaster Gettysburg directed to John Burns. Oh. And we have a copy of the letter. It's at Duke University in North Carolina. Interesting. And the letter says something like, um, hey, um, you know, I was wondering about that Jenny Wade. What can you tell me about her? And so John Burns writes a letter back to um, uh, Frank Moore. And again, he doesn't really enjoy sharing any of the limelight. And I'll bet you it was really a pain in the butt for John Burns. John Burns would go to these cities and give these lectures about himself and him fighting the battle. And invariably at these lectures, people would say, what about that Jenny Wade oh. who was accidentally killed in the fighting? It's annoying. Bacon bread for the soldiers. Bacon, just baking bread. And he fought for his country. Yeah. He wasn't baking bread. Right. She's working on a hobby and he's fighting. <laughs> so on January 22nd, 1866, mm-hmm. Burns wrote a letter to this Frank Moore. And we have a copy of the letter, again, from Duke University. Thank you, Duke University. Yeah. I knew Mrs. Wade very well. The less said about her, the better. Uh-oh. <laughs> the story about her loyalty, her being killed while serving Union soldiers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is all fiction. Got up by some sensation correspondent. The only fact in the whole story is that she is true is that she was killed during the battle in her house by a stray bullet. Charity to her reputation forbids any further remarks. Oh, oh, what is that? What are you saying, John Burns? What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, Poor it's, Jenny. it's his daughter that's listed in the bastard children list. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can oh. refer, if you like, to David Wills, Esquire, or Postmaster Beeler, or any other loyal citizen for the truth. I called her a she-rebel. Oh, <laughs> So now he's questioning her loyalty. <laughs> so anyway, um, jeez. So uh, poor Jenny. I I have to say I bought into all of the uh, Burnsian type hype again about Jenny uh, until I went to your lecture at the Farnsworth House last winter in the before time, and uh, you have all, you have all this uh, new stuff, these new letters yeah. um, that you've. Uh, you, well, I mean, if you you're presented with about. that and you don't have anything else, what do you hey, Well, that's what I'm saying is, right. And so for so long, poor Jenny has been uh, yeah. maligned because of this old bastard. <laughs> and uh, and then now you have these letters that kind of shed more light on her and her relationship with Jack Skelly. And I, I stand corrected. I, I feel like a jerk for believing Mr. Burns. Well, you know, John, um, Frank Moore. Excellent. In his book, Women in the War, Frank Moore just chose not to include the story of Jenny Wade in his book, Women of the War. So uh, so Carrie Sheets is in it. What other women from town are in it? I think there's some women in it that were involved in the hospital activities right. after Gettysburg. But I think she's the only one who's a battle participant that's okay. in the book, if I remember correctly. All right. Um, Roy Mead, a great name uh, for uh, a podcast about Gettysburg. Roy Mead asks, did John Burns try to fight with the Union for notoriety or was it to actually help repel the Confederates? Thanks, guys. You're welcome, Roy. No, I, I think his heart was in the right place. Yeah. I, think, I think he really did believe he could make a difference. I, I think he really did want to go out and want to, you know, fight against the rebels. I mean, the thing, here's the thing. There's a very thin line between bravery and insanity. Yes. <laughs> and this guy's true. all over this line. It's true. So, I mean, I think he did what he did. 
And he was he did it. He didn't do it for fame or fortune. He did it because he wanted to encourage the soldiers and help the soldiers. And, you know, he wanted to make a difference. Hey, hey, if anybody really wants to do something interesting with John Burns and you can find it, I'm sure, on YouTube, there is an episode of You Are There. The Battle of Gettysburg from mm. like 1959. Okay. It was a, before it was a, t- I saw it as a TV show as a kid, mm-hmm. but it was a radio show. And you can find a You Are There radio show about the Battle of Gettysburg. And John Burns is a character in the show. Interesting. And they interview him on the radio. And he tells you, he tells you why he's fighting and why he's doing what he's doing. And, Although it's fictional, I, I think you, uh, you know it's well worth uh, hearing. I wanted to I wanted to mention that a lot of the other townspeople, I think that they would like to go out and join the army and fight the rebels, but they have families, as John Burns does, and maybe you should be in your the safety of your cellar, protecting your wife and children instead of. Uh, out on a adventure on the battlefield. Yeah. Do do we know? Uh, you said before that we don't know uh, what he was doing during the twenty uh, sixth, right? Or on the twenty sixth. Uh, he's he's when yeah you know, twenty six he delivers the message to from Duba early. Duba. Right. Okay. So so early on he doesn't try to do anything obviously because uh, he'd be one man. But now on July first. There's a whole army. Well, there's a corps there. And okay. so it's like, okay, you going to mess with me and my guys? You know, and so he goes out there and, and uh, I would imagine he'd be pissed off. Now, this is the second time these Rebs are coming near and he'd go and fight uh, the Union. Here, is this what you're talking about? You are there, Battle of Gettysburg. This is Don Hollenbeck of General Meade's That's Union it. Army Headquarters somewhere behind the lines near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The situation here on this third day of July, 1863, is grave indeed for the Union forces. Two Confederate attacks have been repulsed in two days of heavy fighting, but the northern casualties have been severe. The Union line is badly shaken, and there's serious concern as to whether it can successfully withstand the next attack. That's expected at any the middle to hear the Confederate troops of General Lee. And for the Let's last see. two years... That ain't got nothing to do with the cannon up yonder. That's where the Yanks are going to get it. Well, nothing's happened yet. Oh my God! Yeah, it's it's a half hour long, ladies and gentlemen. But it's called uh, "You Are There: Battle of Gettysburg." Classic Golden Age radio. Uh, give it a listen. It's uh, yeah. interesting. I'm going to listen I don't, I don't it on the way I home. I footnoted it in the book, and I probably should have. But um, I was going to read. There's a really neat letter. Uh, um, written by, um, uh, let's see. Oh, so some of you are aware of, because uh, William Frastinito put it in his book, Early Photography at Gettysburg, that in 1914 there's an interview with John, with a William Tipton. William Tipton is a 12 year old boy at that time. Right. And he was a witness standing at the edge of Chambersburg Street on the morning of July 1st when John Burns came out of his house and yelled at his neighbors. At Broadhead, right? Wasn't it Joseph Broadhead he, he yelled, yelled at? at? Joseph Broadhead. He's like, come on, Broadhead, let's go. That's right. He's like, oh, Sarah, I gotta go get my beans. Yeah, Sarah Broadhead's uh, husband. Right. Now, he has a glass eye. He only has one eye. Interesting, I didn't know He that. can't be in the military. But okay. he was a lieutenant in the local militia. So he's not, and, and he was out dropping a barricade across the mountain, if you remember Sarah Broadhead's mm-hmm. account, a few days before the battle. Yeah, so, so he's not a coward. No, he's not a coward. He just had to get his beans. beans. And But I think they understand the futility <laughs> of being citizens fighting against the, the thing. But one thing is interesting, there's this 1914 account, and John Wayne Johnston wrote back to William Tipton and said, hey, do you, can you elaborate more on the account you gave and so he did give a uh, more elaborate account. And I, I think this is kind of interesting, so I'll read it here. Uh, this is a 1915 letter, and I published it in the book. And again, it was sitting in this collection in Rochester, New York, and no one had ever read it or seen it, except Johnson, you know. And again, mm-hmm. he never wrote his book he was going to write. John Burns, this is William Tipton speaking. John Burns came out of his house. As Joseph Broadhead, a neighbor, a neighbor with but one eye was passing, Burns called to him and said, get your gun and go along and fight the damned rebels. Broadhead jocularly remarked that he had a gun, 
but no balls. <laughs> Burns said, damn you. Why didn't you melt up your pewter like I did and mold them? After some remark by Broadhead, which I did not get, Burns yelled at him, you damn coward, chicken-hearted squall, tallowed-faced sissy. <laughs> hey, Doug Pace, phony soldier. <laughs> Miss Mary Slance, upon hearing the disturbance, came out of her house next door and rebuked Burns for his remarks and pleaded with him to stay at home and not leave Barbara as it was foolish for him to venture out. Mm-hmm. And it so was. you know, I, I think there's, I think there's a, there's some semblance of mm-hmm. uh, stability here with some of the civilians. Like, oh my God, there's going to be a huge battle. Yeah, we're not prepared for this. It's going to be like unlike anything we have ever seen. There's never been a battle anywhere right. near here, and of course, it ends up being the bloodiest battle in American history. <laughs> and he wants to go out and fight. You know? Yeah. Come on. Right. It's it's crazy. <laughs> It's crazy. And and the thing is, like, really, who among us would do what he did? Crazy or brave? It doesn't That's matter. Right. Like, right. The, he, I don't know if I would do that yeah. this age. And he's like twice my age. Kudos to him. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Almost twice my age. Uh, OK. Uh, Brian Derenick says, can you talk about how John Burns was viewed as Gettysburg residents prior to the battle? We kind of touched on that yeah. and how that might have changed with the fame he received. So we kind of touched on both of those. But yeah. So I think I think the, the, the answer to the last one, for, uh, let, you'd think, OK, I th- you'd think that everyone would would from the outside would just think, oh, OK, so they didn't take him seriously. Mm. But then he did this dramatic deed. And he was wounded in the fighting. And again, I think the 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 in, most interesting thing is when he doesn't run and when he does participate in the fighting and he stands there and is wounded and stays there and gets wounded again, stays there, you know, and is left out there. I, I think it's just, just crazy that yeah. he does that. But um, the townspeople don't respect him afterwards and they think they suspect that it's just another one of his lies that he really didn't fight in the battle that he's making it up Uh, that he got wounded or you know they don't take him seriously afterwards i think when lincoln and you know i'd suggest to the people that are uh working on the script for my john burns movie uh i think that would be a great way to end the movie to have all the townspeople making fun of him before the battle, to have yeah. townspeople questioning whether he really fought the battle. And then when the townspeople see him shake hands with Lincoln and see that that the country is awed by what he did, that would be a great ending. And Sam Elliott would do a good job with that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure they're, I'm sure my, uh, my uh, director and producer are not listening, but uh, if they are. What do you mean? Everybody listens to this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, cool. All right. So, <laughs> so uh, one thing I wanted to, uh, uh, so what we're going with that, with that, with that point about that is, oh, before the battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, I couldn't find like an historical record I could find him paying taxes and him being a constable and being him listed as um, being, um, you know, in the temperance society and him giving a speech on the American party. But what I did find afterwards in reminiscence about him is account after account after account after account, how the townspeople play pranks on him. Uh. Prank after prank. Because he doesn't have a sense of humor uh. and he doesn't get jokes. <laughs> and apparently he's somewhat of a gossip. And so there's a, um, there's a, he would go to one side of town to a barbershop and tell stories about, hey, you should hear what they just said about you down the street. And then he would go down, they would say something about it. He'd go down to the other barbershop and say, hey, you know what they're talking about up there. Mm-hmm. And so these two rivals set him up. And said, well, you see him, you tell him, I'm going to kill him. And then he ran down and told the other guy, and the other guy was going to kill him, and back and forth. And finally it ended where they were walking towards each other with guns in the center of the square, and they were going to shoot each other, and it was all John Burns doing. (laughs) And the town gathered around, and he was really scared, and then everybody started laughing and walked away. (laughs) 
And um, there's a great story about um, he um, he was a dog catcher as part of his constable duties. Now I didn't I didn't find any proof to to back this story up, but he's the uh, the dog catcher. And there's a time when um, uh, there was a particularly uh, harsh dog, and he ended up um, uh, catching the dog. And the other constable says to him, John, what shall we do with it? And John Burns replied, hmm, hang the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and so everybody was like, what you can't nut. hang a dog. <laughs> He's going to hang <laughs> the dog. So according to the story, for years after that, little kids in the town would sneak up and within his hearing yell, hang the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a, a, a joke, a running joke throughout the town. You know who else was a dog catcher? BTK. The serial killer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, we went there. We went there. Wow. Did he hang the dog? He, well, he, <laughs> well, yeah, he, there was some hanging involved. <laughs> Not, not with the animals. Actually, no. He he did like do. Oh, no. There was one dog that was uh, like stray, and he had it put down. Like, and instead of just letting the people know, like he let them know we took the dog and had it put down. It's like, yeah, he was he was a jerk. Uh, all right, we got one question. Uh, well, just one question from the people. I saw a lot of stuff coming in here. Yeah, most of them were unrelated. And I answered. Okay. Were they unfunny jokes? Probably. Okay, so let's go to uh, Kevin Sackett. He says, are the hat and coat that John Burns wore during the battle preserved in a museum? No. So we don't know. The- no. And, and you know, I, I, one thing that I, reading all the accounts, one thing that I kind of um, uh, would like to see, and I, it's not, it, they didn't do it. But when they made the monument to John Burns mm. in uh, 1901, I think they sculpted it. In 1902, they put it out. It's dedicated in 1903 during the 40th anniversary of the battle. You, know, you might notice that the monument is made by a group in Philadelphia. Um, I think it, oh, I forget who did it. Um, but uh, Bureau, the Bureau brothers, Eduardo Bureau, maybe. But he did it to mimic the statue of, by Daniel Chester French of the Minuteman mm, at Concord. Mm. So John Burns is in the fashion of the Minuteman. Okay. But he needs his hat. Yeah. In all the accounts, one thing is clear, he has a black, you know, top, um, hat. top hat on when he's out on the battlefield. It would probably look stupid and, on the statue. Yeah. And they didn't put that, I don't know why, but they decided not to include the hat with the statue. Because it would look dumb. But the clothing he wore that day are not known to exist anywhere. Mm. That, 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 is a, that is a shame. Because then we'd be able to count the bullet holes. Yeah. You can, <laughs> and we you can know, find out. And I bet you there are four of them. Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I saw some uh, lots of names in here. Michael Pellegrini, Bill Pike, Corey Russo. I saw Michael Stump. This is like Romper Room. Remember that show, folks? TJ Files, Becky Steinmiller, uh, Keith McGill. So many people coming in. There's uh, too many to get through. Brian Fields, Kevin Baginski, Martin Long. Uh, Martin Husk was in there as well, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Um, uh, we, a lot of people. Uh, Ed Marshall. Thank you all. Martin Long, James McNeil. Uh, Ricky Fowler, the golfer, a uh, lot of people, a lot of people. I can't read them all, but thanks for watching oh, tonight. What? We got one question from Ricky Fowler. Oh, just in the nick of time, Ricky. That's why that, you know, that's why they call him <laughs> nick of time, Rick. <laughs> I don't think that's his name. Um, <laughs> Rick wants to know, uh, wasn't John Burns found wandering in New York city later in yeah, life? I think that's in, um, Samuel Bates's account written in 75 okay. that, that he is, a. Uh, a pauper and destitute and he's found on the streets of New York wandering and he's very sick and they take him into a hotel and they nurse him up. I was not able to find, I think that account is alluded to in Samuel Bates, but I was not able to find that in a New York newspaper. Okay. And I wasn't able to determine if, um, uh, because he dies in Bonnieville. So yeah. I think mm. when that account was written, it gives the illusion that he like died Just in somewhere, you know, somewhere else in as a pauper. But he ended up living with his nephew in a house in Bonnyvale. The house no longer stands, but I know mm. right where the house was. It's near um, 
not too far from the pizza place. Oh yeah, in Center of Bonnyville. Okay, if you can picture that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, huh. uh, but uh, I am familiar with that with that account. There's also um, um, I found an account in the paper that um, uh, John Burns is in uh, one of the versions of the Cyclorama. You know how there's five versions yeah. of the Cyclorama. Huh. That they put him in a version, and in that version, they put him with his cows, like in the background. Uh, somewhere behind the Leicester house, he's with his cows. <laughs> oh, God. I'll we'll have to ask Sue Boardman yeah, about that. Sue Boardman. Yeah. Article. That's interesting. That Did you ever go to one of the uh, a night with the Cyclorama? I mean, not, when, the, not when she has done it, no. Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah, she is good. I loved it. It I'll, was so I'll see, interesting. I'll see her tomorrow. Well, so. tell her that I was raving about a night with the Cyclorama that she Keith did. Keith McGill, you read. I'll, I'll see him tomorrow. Oh, you know him? Oh, great. Volunteers at Adams County Historical Society. Very nice, very nice. James Terry is watching. Do you know him? No. Okay, well, he just came in. But <laughs> sorry, James, you got here late. We're about to <laughs> we're about to wrap it up. Thank you all for listening. Uh, don't forget, again, like and share, subscribe, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Turn the notifications on. And please consider becoming a patron today over at patreon.com slash address in Gettysburg so that we could do more of this stuff more often and more... With uh, with RAM in our computer that actually uh, works. Uh, <laughs> until next time, though, have a good one, ladies and gentlemen. Our hearts of stone have got a stain for seeing to stone from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's followed down and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's followed down and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen All right, we're done uh, with that. So we'll just do... Uh... There is no time. Okay. All righty. All right. Uh, thanks, Bill. We're still alive, so don't don't go showing your fanny or anything. There is no time. We didn't do that. That one doesn't get used enough. No, I know. There is oh, no time. No, it gets used a lot, <laughs> let me tell you. You just haven't heard. There all. is no time. You Eric? just haven't heard Eric, all the videos. I have told you there is no time for that. There is no time. <laughs> You've pissed off Robert E. Lee for the last time. I know where you live, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> My boy's got the dander up. Oh boy, Lordy, Lordy. I miss the I miss the old days <clears throat> of just doing a with like a variety talk show. You know. A lot more freedom. You did, know, you, to, uh, did you sing or dance? I did. Or did uh, I did it all. I did it That's all. I did magic awesome. tricks. Um, spun some plates <laughs> with some. Were you a juggler? I did it all. Oh my god! I was a vaudevillian. You know, Lordy. All right. Or, well, uh, what do you call it? Not a vaudevillian. Uh, burlesque dancer. I was a burlesque oh, dancer. Christ. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well. Don't, uh, I think we should end on that note. Well, if you want to, I'd yeah. be happy to sit and talk with the people for a little longer. If you, well, it's, yeah, you so know, it's, I am, I am. What is that, Mike? Mike Lentz, uh, so patron, how, patron extraordinaire. Would you say? So, how is that uh, the new headquarters of the ACHS good. coming along? Oh yeah, good. we started uh, working on the ground today. Yeah. Cutting down some trees. Oh yeah, yeah. I saw the uh, I saw oh. the equipment over there. Yeah. Talking about the new Adams County Historical Society. For those of you who didn't hear Mike in the background there, go ahead there. Uh, so you you broke ground today, uh, or yeah. you what? You start clearing trees? Yeah, we just started clearing trees. So okay, so real construction will start like next week, I think. So you're actually out there with a axe and a saw? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who's okay. you got? I don't uh, think Tim's you got the heavy equipment trees. in there. C.E. Williams. Okay. Nice. Well, that's good. When is, when is that supposed to be finished? Who knows? Okay. <laughs> Great. Next Fair year. Enough. Next year. I'm looking forward to uh, whenever that is. End of next year. What was, the, what was the John Burns item that you said that you had? that uh, with the, Oh, the cane. I'd really like to see that cane. Yeah, we have a cane with an inscription on it that says, uh, 
given to him by the city council of Pittsburgh in like 1866. Also, all that the the constable um, the constable returns returns. Yeah, I'd like to see those too. We'll have, love- a, we'll have a display on John Burns. I was hoping to have a John Burns wax figure, like him dressed in his in battle his, regalia. In his albino beaver hat. Albino beaver hat. That is a hell of a painting. It is a, it is a really <laughs> nice painting. <laughs> that is a great and, um, painting. And <laughs> when you sit online, there's, there's, uh, some of them are colorized better than others. Yeah. It's, it's the original painting hangs at the Hill School in Pottstown. If you do Hill School, Pottstown, John Burns. <laughs> they actually, I think they started selling them. It's part of a series of great Americans or something like that. It was, he did them for a book. That one. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the best. Do you see the swirling, the swirling battle? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it's, I, you know, everybody's in, it's just everybody's pandemonium. In He's just Except standing for there. John Burns. Yeah. <laughs> He's standing there resolute <laughs> with his old flintlock fowler. <laughs> And that white beaver hat. <laughs> the hat is... It's amazing. It, it's, it does it, look like Uncle Sam. That's Uncle the, Sam and, uh, came out of the recruiting poster and decided to go fight at Gettysburg. <laughs> Did, uh, it's phenomenal. The house, I love the picture, the wider shots of the house because there's nothing around it. Yeah. Like, it's just that house there. It's pretty, pretty cool. The house is gone, is it not? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I've heard people say that the house that's on the corner there no. is the house, and no. I didn't think so. Cool, <laughs> Tim. Let him let him get a word in. <laughs> it's not for me. I'm clarifying for the people. Right, right. You right. do it all the time. I know. We've had this discussion. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Quiet. <laughs> but you can, if you look at this. Look, here's the probably the best evidence. There's a photograph when there, there, there's two houses in the spot where his one house oh, was. Yeah. And this photograph shows that the house sits back. The first, the second house from the corner was built in front of that, and the house still still stood. And you can see the house on the corner is not there yet in this image. Do you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. I, I, yeah, I see it. And so that clears, clearly indicates the house. And here, here's what I think is really cool. And I, I've never, I don't know the people that live there, but this house was not under where the houses are today. It was in the backyard of where those houses were. Could we do an archaeological dig in their backyard mm. and pull up stuff from John Burns's like original you know, basement? Basement, and stuff? yeah, <laughs> my, yeah. My, my Karn says. This is the part where they reveal Tim will be playing John Burns in the movie. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm mean and curmudgeon enough. No, when you when you do mean and curmudgeonly, it's more comical. I could do it, but so, you'd have to put another like no, yeah. forty years on me. Well, they they have makeup and stuff; they could age you. That's possible. <laughs> I'm a bit wider than he was too, if we're being honest. <laughs> I don't know oh, if they can make up and, that uh, away. One of the accounts of the battle I should mention in the morning action where he's standing on his porch, uh-huh. standing near the seminary, he's wearing a white linen duster. Yeah. Mm. And in this particular photograph uh, from the encampment of the 50th Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. he's wearing a white linen duster, just like Clint Eastwood. Is <laughs> 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 uh, that, that not true? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That is a cool picture. I've seen that picture before, and I didn't realize that was him until three months ago. That was pretty neat. Uh, Rick Fowler wants to know, was John Burns used in any Army recruitment drives during the late 19th, early 20th century? I I don't know about that. No, that's Uh, good. That would be good. No. But I was going to say the Sanitary Commission used him for raising funds during the war. So during the war, yes, but mm, not to, maybe no, not so I, much I seen later on. No. I now, feel like he was probably kind of forgotten by yeah. then. Yeah. yeah. I mean, except Hey, Chris, here, Chris Elliott is watching, guys. I don't think it's I'm a that huge Chris fan. Oh. I'm just going to throw that out there. 
probably if why. you are that Chris Elliott big that's fans awesome. big fans but, of uh, you know uh, Get a Life was one of my favorite shows in the nineties uh, and of course uh, Shit's Creek. Oh my God, I love that show. You know, I mean, you're just fantastic, Mr. Elliot. Thank you for watching. All right. All right. Cool. Are, are we ready now? Yeah, no, I've been ready. Okay. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. Ed Marshall, thank you for watching. Well, have a good night, folks. Okay, and bye. May the Lord bless and keep you. Bye bye. Okay, bye.